G'day, welcome to the latest Green Left Show. Um, re we're recording this the day after yesterday's federal election in Australia, uh, which was basically very good results for the left. Um, the the right-wing conservative Morrison government has been thrown out on their ear very decisively. That's good news. The Greens have had a big increase in vote and also notably a big increase in their number of lower house seats, yet to be determined the final number, but again, very good news. The so-called Teal Independents have also scored a number of victories, kicked out a few LNP people, good news. Also, even though the media haven't focused on it very much, the socialist vote is up, more good news. We're going to be discussing some of these things in the in the Green Left Show today. Before we get underway, I'm going to acknowledge that we are recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Uh, this is always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Also, I just want to say at the outset that um, uh, if you like the work we do, please become a Green Left supporter. It is the most important way to support the work that we do. Um, small monthly payment makes a big difference to us. It also is the best way to get the, the content that we produce. There's a link in the description as well. Without paying a cent, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, share this video or this podcast. Uh, please help us spread the word. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this has been good news. and I wanted to turn first of all to make a congratulations to the Greens for their, to their successful result and turn to Adam Bant, the Greens leader, who called it a green slide. Well, this is a great result. It is a green slide. The Greens have got the highest result we've ever recorded. We're on track to be the biggest third party in the Senate and to grow in the lower house as well with new members from Griffith and from Ryan and potentially a number of other seats that are in the hunt as well. This is a great result that delivers a mandate for action on climate and action on inequality. This puts climate and inequality on the political table and they'll never be able to take it off again. So we'll wait till the results come in across the rest of the country to find out whether the Greens are part of a, a minority power share in Parliament in the lower house but whatever happens over the next couple of weeks, this is history in the making. This is fighting for a future for all of us. I'm here with Sam Wainwright, um, Socialist Lions National co-convener, and also was the Socialist Lions candidate for the seat of Fremantle, where Socialist Lions did win a small increased vote. Uh, please, Sam, can you tell us your thoughts about the election result and what it all means? Look, I think uh, there's a few observations to make. One, I think, is that the Morrison government was clearly, um, you know, it was the victim of both, well, victim's probably not <laughs> the right word to use. It was the deserved the des deserved recipient of uh, the accumulation of frustration that builds up with a, with, you know, with a pretty ruthless, racist, sexist, um, pro-capitalist government. Um, so in addition just to the general time for change sort of sentiment, uh, there's no doubt that there were specific, you know, specific and growing kind of constituencies of people who were angry about things like things like corruption, um, which things like the sports rorts effectively were, um, the absolute hopeless, terrible response of the Morrison government to uh, sexual harassment and assault within Parliament itself. Um, it's uh, your deliberate cultivation of a right-wing religious vote on the question of um, trans people's rights, uh, but also, of course, climate. And I think that's, I think that's a really important marker of this election is that the the rearguard action being fought by the coalition to sort of preserve, to effectively preserve climate change denialism as a mainstream part of Australian political discourse in order to protect the position of the fossil fuel industry that's finally sort of cracked and crumbled. Um, and in that sense, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, if you look at, compared to the rest of the world, it's no, it's no, it's no great, it's no great achievement, you know, but it kind of moves us into the space where we can actually have a discussion. Okay. We accept that climate change is real. Now, what the hell is, are we actually going to do about it? And, 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 and what is going to be necessary to make the change that's needed um, and how, and how can that happen? So it kind of clears the deck so we can have that discussion. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's that that that's filtered down through the Australian population and through electorates in different kind of ways. And I think I think the election of the teal independence kind of shows that as well. You know, you can you can have a very sort of mainstream pro capitalist, you know, market orientated sort of world view uh, of politics and all that kind of thing. But it's except that climate change is real. You know, and the attempt by the Morrison government to try and hang on to some of those inner city seats. Um, 
while still, you know, peddling real sort of hidebound social conservatism and climate change denialism was eventually going to burst, you know, and, and, and it has. I think the other really significant thing, of course, is the, is the increase in the Greens vote and the, the, the likely fact that they will go, the, the likelihood that they'll go from one to three seats in, in, in the lower house. I think it shows that they're, they're also that there is an appetite for um, big picture change, uh, bold, ambitious change, uh, precisely the thing that Labor Party shrunk away from. In the in, in in the light of the 2019 election, you know where they um, after you know they, they they put to bed the um, their proposal to get rid of um, you know negative gearing and other tax breaks for landlords and 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 um, sort of so called middle class welfare, um, and the the fact that the Greens went for that shows that there is that appetite for change in the first instance, and also secondly underscores the fact that there is a generational, I think, well just. You don't want to simplify it to generational, but a gener generational and income divide within the Australian working class. I mean, for people who, you know, who are under the age of 30, who, who don't own their own home and have no expectation that they'll ever be able to own their own home, housing affordability is just a crucial issue. And the Labor Party just scrimped it, you know, didn't have it, really have anything to offer. And additionally, that's a layer of people who very often have never had the experience of permanent full-time work. You know, they don't, they're not used to annual leave or sick leave, let, al let alone long service leave. I mean, that's just a sort of fantasy. So, you know, that's been, I think that's been a growing sort of um, uh, kind of, you know, a growing storm in Australian politics. And I think, you know, the Labor Party's just assumed, well, you know, those people will just vote for Labor because Labor's better than the Libs, you know, um, even if by not much on, 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 on some counts. Um, but no, that's not enough. And so I think that's why we've seen the rejection of the, of the, the Morrison government reflected in both um, you know, increase for, for Labor, but also for, 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 for Greens and the, and the Teal Independence. But I think the real take home message is that it, it clears the decks and opens the space for us to talk about the action that is going to be needed for climate. And, and of course, that sort of action is going to be really, really, really you know, it's going to be grassroots action, you know, because there's, there's, there's no question at all that the more ambitious features of the Greens platform, um, which I wholeheartedly support, will we'll, we'll need. Um, you know, they won't be one in Parliament alone, that's for sure. The headline result of this election is that the Morrison government is being kicked out and that we now have a Labor um, Albanese government. Beyond that, the most striking feature of the election is the big increase in vote for the Greens and for other um, minor parties and independents, not predominantly going to the far right, the One Nations and the, the Clive Palmers of the world, who haven't particularly made a big impact on this election. Uh, given this striking result and the, and the very low primary vote for the ALP, can you please tell us what your thoughts are about what this means for the Labor Party's small target strategy and also what challenges and opportunities are there for the, for the Greens and the progressive movement at the moment? Well, it's worth bearing in mind that for some decades now, the, the share of the primary vote going to either Labor or the coalition has been in decline. Uh, and the, the, the so-called stable two-party system that was a feature not just of this country, but other developed countries after the Second World War, on the back of the post-World War II boom and the kind of social consensus that, that it produced and general prosperity, growing wages, growth of the welfare state, you know, that, that produced that stable two-party two, two system. But that, that, came to a, that, that came to an end, um, that, 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 that the, the, the prosperity, the uninterrupted growth, low unemployment and growth of the welfare state, that came to an end by the, by, by, by the late 1970s. And from the early 1980s onwards, all across the Western world, we saw attempts to roll back the welfare state and to drive down workers' conditions and rights in order to preserve, in to, in order to preserve profits in the face of the end of that, that, that period of unprecedented boom. And so that, that previous stability or social consensus that had made the two party two-party two system possible has been in, in decline for a long time. Now, that, that process has not been as advanced in Australia compared to other Western countries. One, because Australia has tended, you know, to, has dodged the worst of it uh, economically, uh, but also because of our electoral system. So, you know, there's, there's lots of other places around the world uh, where, you know, there's proportional representation in, in, in the parliament. So if we'd had proportional represent, rep, rep, representation in our lower house, you would have seen you know, minority governments would already be the norm in Australia. It would have been for a long time, you know. Um, so it's just it's had to grow to this point for the Greens, for instance, to get this breakthrough um, representation in, in 
in the in, in the lower house, and that that could. I mean, my expectation is that that will grow now because now now it be, you know it appears like a real incredible thing. You know that you know you don't just you know the Greens won't just have representation in the Senate, but they can have it in the lower house as well. And 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 the, and the same with those kind of in, in, independents. So it's, it's it's a bit like. You know, Labor and Liberal. You know, the the, the majority or the, the the proportion of seats that Labor and Liberal have have, have guarded in the lower house of Parliament has been artificially inflated, and they've sort of it's been like a dam which has kind of finally burst open, kind of thing. So I think that's that's actually a very good thing because it more it more accurately reflects the diversity, both good and bad. You know, um, that that's emerged in Australian Australian um, opinion in Australian politics um, as a part of this decline of. Of that vote, but overwhelmingly, it's a, it's a good thing because it just opens up space for for for, for real political discussion uh, and 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 ways for progressives to point to the way forward. So, specifically on the small target strategy, was this clever tactics or a big mistake, or is this just inherently Labor? There's Labor's got no other option other than to uh, to offer not very much. Well, I think probably all of the all all, all of the above, really. Um, no, no question about it. Um, you know, both Labor and Liberal have got themselves utterly trapped by this um, on this question of housing affordability, for instance. I think that's that, that's really the emblematic one, you know, in this um, in this federal federal election. Um, but you know, Labor's sort of historically determined political and social function in Australian politics is to be, you know, is to be the sort of if you like the spare wheel of Australian capitalism, you know, I think, you know, big business prefers to deal, you know, rule directly through, um, through, through, through the liberals when they can. Um, but, you know, even the Murdoch media, you know, much that, much that they were sort of still, still trying to, you know, cl cling onto the coalition recognises, you know, that they need Labor to get in every now and then to sort of clear the decks, to let off a bit of steam, you know, to show everyone that, look, democracy does work and we can all go back to normal, that sort of stuff. I mean, the, unfortunately, the cycle that we're used to, the cycle of Australian politics is Labor invariably disappoints, people get demoralised, uh, and then the Liberals get back in and we go through the cycle again, which is kind of the whole purpose of the of the whole, you know, without being sort of conspiratorial about it, that's 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 just, that's organically the, the, the way the thing works. So, you know, Labor, you know, Ever since working people won universal suffrage over a hundred years ago, the, ch the, the challenge, of course, for um, for politicians has been to pretend to rule on behalf of the majority of the population while actually <laughs> ruling for the capitalists. You know, that's that, that's the challenge both for 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 for, for, for liberal and labour, um, and they've got sort of different, essentially different sort of tactics and ways of doing that. I don't say that to diminish, you know, the fact that the fact that there are there are good activists who are in the Labor Party and you know believe that working with the Labor Party is the most effective thing. Do, or that good, you know, positive reforms haven't been won through, through, through Labor governments, you know, invariably from, you know, social pressure from below. But that's, that's, that inevitably, that that's just the space that Labor, the Labor Party is sort of trying to trying to play in and operate in. And in, in the context of um, the end of that post World War Two boom that I talked about, you know, the, that that's why the, the end of that boom is why neoliberalism has just become the norm across um, all the Western countries, and why the Labor Party and its equivalent. And its equivalents in other countries have all adapted to neoliberalism and the agenda of privatization and cutbacks and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's really reduced the margin for manoeuvre, you know, because Labor's still got to be able to throw some crumbs to its base, you know, it's still got to do some positive reforms, you know, which of course we should welcome, you know, which is why us progressives, notwithstanding the kind of the general, um, you know, description of the place, you know, my, my very cynical take on the place that the Labor plays in, in Australian politics. We, of course, we still, we still welcome a Labor victory because any, you know, any, any reform, no matter how small, um, is, it, it, in the real world, um, is still, it's still vitally important for working people. So we, 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 have, we have to be able to sort of relate to that, you know, latch onto what's good and then talk about, well, what, what more we need. And that's, you know, the election result makes, definitely makes that possible. Um, and yes, so you know, our, our job, I would say, for any progressive, is to jump in and and and, and demand, you know, dem demand the, you know, the, the use Labor's victory, notwithstanding Labor's relatively sort of small target approach on most issues, is to to use its victory to, um, to, um, to to call for the big target things. And I guess, do you have any more comments specifically about the big uh, green result? I think it's actually, uh, I'm pretty sure the Greens have won all three seats in Brisbane, uh, plus Melbourne, and possibly one or two others that are still up for grabs in other parts of the country. Yeah, well, look, obviously, the more the better. And that really, you know, that increases the likelihood that the Labor 
a minority Labor government would depend on green support um, rather than teal independent support, or it might change the balance upon which up, upon which that happens. And it's it, it's interesting the way the um, the big sort of pitch for the of the or one of the major pitches of the Greens election campaign is you know, give us the balance of power um, so we can get all you know do all these um, great things, you know. Um, and I've, as I've said elsewhere, I think, you know, um, being in, in that position of so-called balance of power, you know, we we'll certainly will give the Greens space to, to to demand some concessions of Labor. I think that's true. And it, and, and it just sort of puts pressure on the, the strong Greens results, put pressure on Labor's flank as well. I mean, as, as, much they, as much they may not admit it. The Greens, the Labor Party strategists will, will be recognising that, that, you know, there's this, this, this pressure on their left flank that's opened up, you know. Um, and I think that's, that's actually more significant than the actual the numbers in the parliament, you know, because um, we should never lose sight of the fact that the real balance of power in parliament is actually Labor, the combined vote of Labor and Liberal. The majority of the times Labor and Liberal vote together on stuff. Um, and the, I think the, the, the more... So I, look, I think I think the Greens will be in a position to extract some concessions out of Labor, which is which is good, and the more they can, the better. Um, but the point I'd also make very strongly um, that I've that I've said elsewhere, as I said, is that the more the more ambitious, the more significant um, demands that the Greens have raised this election, uh, which which are which I support wholeheartedly, which are very good things like treaty and end to, to fossil fuel subsidies. Um, wiping student debt and making university free, a million public housing homes. I mean, they are all tremendous things, things that this country desperately, urgently needs. Um, but I, um, look, I'd be delighted to be proven wrong, but I do not think a Labor government, you know, a minority Labor government is going to agree to any of those things. Um, and they, they, they just won't. They run, they run too, too counter to the, to the interests of Australian capitalism. And, you know, they're not, they don't, um, you know, threaten the survivability of the system itself. Um, you know, there are there are there, there are other countries where there is free university education, such as Chile, for example. But of course, in Chile, which is a poorer country than than Australia, free free university education was only won after an absolutely dogged um, mass movement, a student protest movement, uh, forced that out of the Chilean government. Uh, so there's there's no reason to believe that we would not require the same thing in Australia, you know, to win, you know, to sign really significant reinvestment in, in public housing, you know, a treaty, you know, a real treaty, you know, a treaty with land rights, um, where Aboriginal people, um, you know, are not forced to trade away um, their, their land rights to, to, to mining companies, as happens under native title, and, and those other things that, I mean, that they would definitely require big social movement pressure, real pressure uh, from, from on Labor, on, on the Labor Party, filtering into the Labor Party's social base and pushing up the, up towards those politicians. And as for the change that we would need to, to, to stop runaway global warming, well, that, that I would say will we'll, we'll need a social pressure, a combined social pressure, a social movement on a scale that we've never seen in this country. Um, that's actually hard for us to imagine. You know, I, I, you just have. I, you know, I think we have to need to imagine the Vietnam War movement, the women's movement, the climate movement, every social movement that's happened ever since the Second World War, all fused into one mighty, mighty movement pushing. You know, that's what it's going to take. This, this, I don't. You know, because we're just running up against that that that, that the central interest of Australian capitalism. Um, so. You know, it's all before us, basically. But so I think the election in it sees from that scale, the election is, is only a small step forward. Um, but within the time frame of the last few years and, the, and the, this being stuck in this ludicrous sort of spiral with with, with, with the liberals trying to hang on to climate denialism, obviously, and it, you know, it, it represents a significant step forward. Your comment about the balance of power uh, with Labor and Liberal, you know, on, on this sort of unity ticket and, and holding the balance of power jointly, I mean, that was very clearly the case in the 1980s under Hawke and Keating, where Labor and Liberal voted together overwhelmingly, or, you know, the, the, the large majority of the time. But I wonder how much this is changing um, under the Gillard government, for example, the Tony Abbott um, opposition, the whole three words, slogans, um, no great big tax, etc. Uh, and internationally, with the experience in the United States, with the Trump and the Republicans, uh, almost not letting the Democrats get away with anything. Like, the, I wonder if the if the if the right is is turning to a uh, to more aggressive tactics, and and is it is that still true to say that Labor and Liberal would form the balance of power? Uh, look, I think this. I, I might be wrong, and you know, I, I don't actually know the percentages of of, of how much uh, you know 
you know, in legislation over what period of time, you know, Labor and Liberal have voted the same way. But I think you can, but what you can say with absolute certainty is that they're on a unity ticket when it comes to the really decisive, important stuff. So $170 billion for nuclear submarines, bipartisan support. Fossil fuels, you know, subs, you know, billions of dollars of annual subsidies to the fossil fuel companies, bipartisan support. Expanding uh, new um, oil and gas mines, bipartisan support. Will, will there be bipartisan oppos opposition to making university free? I think so. <laughs> a million homes, treaty with land rights, yes. You know, so on, on all the really, on all the, on, on all the foundational pillars of Australian society, there is consensus uh, between Labor and Liberal. I think that's that that's the important uh, thing. You know, so you, you, if you sort of brush aside the froth and bubble, um, that that remains the truth. Finally, I want to ask you about the socialist vote. I mean, obviously, in the scheme of things, it still remains small, but it is important to note that pretty much across the board, wherever socialists ran, our votes went up. And even though these are still small results, this is actually quite significant. I wonder if you've got any comments about what this means, what this means for those who are looking for anti-capitalist change in particular. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, broader comments about the, the socialist vote. Yes. Look, so, look. In the first instance, the, you know, the socialist vote is still very small, um, both you know, uh, both in absolute terms and just you know, the, the, the socialist movement or a sort of explicitly anti-capitalist activist political force in Australian politics is still is is, is, is still very small. Uh, but the fact that where socialists ran that their votes increased, or you know, um, shows that there is nonetheless in this country still a voice. There, there's still there's still an audience for people looking for um, what I would call anti-capitalist politics and politics that is driven by an understanding that, that change needs to happen on the streets and in the workplace and in the community. And we, and we need to build that, that organic sort of movement for change, you know? So for, for the most part, you know, understandably, uh, after, you know, after grinding through all these years of Morrison government, um, most people just sort of um, seek the line of least resistance, you know, or, you know, which is just, you know, just to vote Labor. It's just about vote Labor and get Morrison out. Or, uh, and then if they're a bit more ambitious, or we'll just vote Green. Um, but, you know, to, to understand that it, it, it's going to take a whole lot more than that to get the change we need, it does require much, you know, much as a, requires a high level of consciousness and commitment and understanding of, of how social change happens, how it takes place, you know. And, you know, um, while we should be impatient to, you know, to, 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 to grow that, it's, there's, it, it, it's going to grow out of the circumstances as well, you know, and we should not lose sight of the fact that Australia, you know, even relative to other sort of advanced capitalist industrialised countries is relatively conservative, you know, stable, prosperous and conservative. That's not to say there aren't people who are really hurting and there aren't particularly dysfunctional mad things about Australian capitalism such as the housing market um, but that also you know that's the, that's the reality in, in Australia but the, it's like there, there is nonetheless a growing audience of people um, you know who, who who recognize that we do need to, to stop climate change we need system change however exactly they define that you know what the system is that they, they kind of understand that that it's not you know there's, there's not going to be a green capitalism. It, it's not, you know, there won't, won't be a bit of tweaking to the, you know, to, to business as usual um, and have that experience of how, how you make change. There is a growing audience for that. It's still not as big as it is in other, other comparable countries, but it is there, it is growing. And, and I, th I think the socialist campaigns are still important, very important for that reason. Um, because exactly which way the Greens will go in response to this situation is not yet resolved either, you know. Um, we just don't know, and and it's actually struggle on the street and in the communities is also is going to determine that as well. You know, um, so are the Greens going to pick up that that definitely more grassroots, um, anti-capitalist and insurgent sort of um, theme or tone that that that, we, that we've seen in, in Brisbane in particular? Is that going to be? Is it going to continue evolving in that direction? Um, and are the Greens going to meet that need uh, that we have? Um, Maybe they will. I, I definitely hope so. You know, but there'll certainly there'd be pressure. You can imagine in a minority government situation, there'd also be pressure on the Greens to accept, you know, junior cabinet positions. Um, you know, to show that they can achieve things and get things done. And you know, by itself, that's not you know, that's no, not a problem. And the, the Greens will need to negotiate with Labor to, to get things done. Um, but if you if if they end up being drawn down the vortex of being of of not just participating in a Labor government, but 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 showing loyalty to it, you know, and not breaking with it, and not voting against it or criticising it when it when it does, you know, neoliberal 
things, which hurt, hurts working people and hurts the climate, which it will surely do, which surely will, then that would be a real problem. You know, that would actually, um, uh, that would be a real setback and that would send us in the wrong direction. And, you know, this, this kind of process has evolved um, further in other countries, you know. So in, in, in places like Ireland and Germany, the Greens have moved to the right, you know, faced with that sort of, you know, comparable balance of power situation, they've, they've gone in the wrong direction, you know, and become part of the problem. Um, so we, you know, we desperately don't need that to happen in Australia. Um, we just don't know how that's going to be resolved yet. And I think, I think the socialist campaigns um, uh, are a useful way of having that dialogue with, with, with people who recognise that we need system change. Well, thanks for joining us, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm glad you could join us, uh, join with us today. Um, please do support the Green Left Show. Uh, share this video, give it a thumbs up, uh, share the podcast if you're listening in. Um, if, remember, as always, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter. It is the most important way you can support our work and it makes a big difference. Uh, plus, it's the best way to get the content that we produce. You can also uh, show us some love on Patreon if that's more to your preference. Um, in any case, uh, this is the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.